If you understand digital camera technology, you're not going to believe what I'm going to say in the next two minutes. But if you'll stick with me for five minutes, I think you might even believe that every digital camera on the market today, and this includes smartphones, is going to be tragically and totally obsolete by 2014. 2013 is too soon, it might be as slow as 2015, but just for simplicity, let's say 2014, the entire world of digital cameras is changed. Nobody incurs any obligation of any kind by listening to this and what I'm about to tell. Just so your most conservative attorneys, your most conservative IP people can understand this and so it will be free to talk, I'm going to post this on YouTube. It's probably going to be titled 2014 The Super Camera and that's about as public as you can get. Therefore, there is no confidential information being divulged on this video. No confidential information, no obligation. We can talk. You incur no risk. Okay, now we're going to talk about the features of this super camera. First of all, it fits in a shirt pocket, okay? That's not terribly exciting, is it? I mean, it's interesting, but just wait till you see the features that follow and that become possible with the technology we're going to talk about. How about an f.0.7 lens, a two-element lens that is f.0.7? Okay, now, do we need lenses that fast? No, I've got a car that will do 260 kilometers per hour. Do I need that speed? No. But is it nice to have it sometimes? Yeah. And if you're taking a picture of one of your children diving in a swimming pool indoors where the lighting is marginal, and you've got a crowd of people around the edge of the pool, you don't know any of them, isn't it nice to be able to blur them out of the picture and get a crisp picture of your child in the middle of that arc with no blur. I mean, fast lenses are terrific. We've lost them just because people are doing more optical zooms, which will become obsolete, by the way, as digital zoom, as sensors get better and better and better. It's coming. Nobody sees that yet, but that's going to be a big deal. Because you have faster lenses, you won't be needing flash. Most of those smartphone pictures are party pictures at night, and we all know what flash does to photography. Flash bleaches out faces in the foreground and darkens the background. If it's one of those cameras that goes ding, 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 and pre-flashes to shut down the pupils so you don't get red eye or pet eye, uh, then um, you've lost that candid moment. And, and also flash kind of makes the chin line stronger. Hopefully it's, it's a little little stronger than mine, or in some cases you can see up their nostrils, which is very pleasant, sorry. So we're going to save a lot of battery life in those smartphones. So second feature is super fast lens in a shirt pocket camera. Our next feature will be, if I can get the tape off, <laughs> a 20 to 1 zoom. Okay, now I'm starting to lose you. You are starting to say, this is outrageous, this is, this is crazed, this does not make any sense. Just stick with me for a bit. 20 to 1 zoom, digital, with high quality, with higher quality than you're getting today by far from optical zoom, is going to be very, very possible and practical. Now we're getting very interesting, aren't we? Wider temperature operation. This is a camera for some unique reasons. We'll uh, operate in the Sahara or uh, in the Siberia and it won't fog, it won't rust, it won't have as much corrosion, and it's kind of a little simple and not too meaningful side benefit. Uh, a huge benefit if you're doing a satellite camera going from uh, sun to shade, but uh, just kind of a nice little extra thing that happens to come with the, de with the design concepts that we will be using in this camera. So that, that's, that's not a big deal, but it's something.
You'll be able to take close-ups with the same camera, with the same speeds. This is a big deal. This has never happened before. This will take macro photos with wide open speeds and if you need them. And it's just kind of a, uh, uh, I think between this and this and this, I think you will agree, if I can convince you that this is possible, this will change all of photography and cameras. Now the last is my anticipation of probable price. $300 to $500 retail in the U.S. Um, this really depends on how the manufacturer or manufacturers see the market potential and how they choose to amortize the research and development costs, which will be non-trivial. And uh, I think if it has a market size of, let's say, half of the market in the first few years, half of the total market, then I think the $300 price is very, very practical because you'll have plenty of margin there. Up until now, you've heard nothing from me but outlandish, crazed, and uh, very difficult to believe claims for what the features will be. Now we're going to get into the details, and I think you will see how it is going to be within reach by 2014. Every optical engineer will verify this, that this is like a typical camera lens. Look at all those elements that, that we have to go through to get to a flat sensor. These are necessary. Look at the eyeball. One lens and the eyeball will operate in moonlight or sunlight. Not many cameras will. And it gives you almost as much resolution as some of the best cameras today. This is the heart of the big change that's coming. Now, if you were to Google this, and I think you should, Google this. This is the language that techies and optical engineers use for curved focal plane arrays. You will see a couple of things. First of all, you're going to see 24,000 listings, 24,000 papers printed about curved focal plane arrays. It's coming. Curved focal plane arrays, they also, the, but you know, there's a problem. All of those papers, none of them show how to practically make a curved sensor. They have, they have exotic ways, but they don't have any practical ways. And what they have are ways that are going to cost billions and billions and billions of dollars to do. But none of them show how to do it using existing sensor manufacturing capabilities. I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay, let's go back to the basics real quickly before we jump into this. Let's assume this is a sensor almost flat, but when, when a light beam hits the center of a sensor, it's just fine. It's got a 90 degree angle, perfect, and even as it gets a little further out, the distance between the light and the sensor stays almost the same. It's just when you get out here that the angle gets sharper and problems arise, and the distance gets greater so the light is weaker on the edges. Now that's the reason optical engineers over the last century and a half have developed all of these formulas for correcting that inherent problem. It's a big problem. Optical engineers have fixed it. But the fixes mean lenses are huge chunks of glass. They're heavy. They are slow. They let less light through and the problems have gotten very bad. Now, what, what we're going to do next is remind you about sensor manufacturing. And, and this is another basic point. I, we've covered why flat sensors are bad. Now I'd like to cover why smaller sensors are cheaper to make than big sensors. What we will do here is that let's say this is a sample section out of a wafer of sensors. This is nine sensors. 
What, what the manufacturers do is they make them in things called wafers that are big, and then they almost cut them up like a saw, and they end up with, here are nine. But three of these nine have flaws in them, right there, right there, and right there. This is what determines the cost of a sensor. It's the yield that you can get. And because we have three damaged ones out of this group of nine, we get a 67% yield. But let's say that we made this of smaller sensors. We just cut them this way, and then we cut them this way, and we cut them this way. And then in this example where we're using square, sometimes they're rectangles, we do this. Okay, now what do we have? Now we have a 96% yield. Because we got 78 out of 81. 78 good. from 81. This is a fundamental fact of sensor manufacturing. Smaller sensors covering the same area in groups are cheaper than big sensors. This will be important to what we're going to look at next.